Today is uh, July 18th, 2016, and we're talking with Dr. Tom Ofterheide, Professor of Emergency Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ofterheide, first, can you uh, tell us how did you become interested in the field of medicine? What, what led you to go to medical school? You know, uh, I had always just wanted to help people. And even in my interviews, no one ever believed me. <laughs> okay. But my true fundamental motivation to become a physician was to help others. Mm -hmm. And you went to school at the Un University of Minnesota, if I remember correctly. Uh, I went uh, undergrad uh, to, at, to Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. uh, I am from Minnesota originally and uh, went to the University of Minnesota for medical school. I did internal medicine residency at the University of Minnesota. Found that um, less than personally satisfying. At that time, uh, you were able to moonlight in emergency departments. And every time I worked in the emergency department, I just had fun. I felt like I was making a contribution to the patients that I cared for and realized that this is what I really wanted to do. Um, the Medical College of Wisconsin was one of the first residencies at that time in uh, emergency medicine where you could get academically trained and board certified. And I came here, uh, got marvelous training, and stayed on as a faculty. I've had one job my entire <laughs> life. Now, when you, when you came here then for your, for your fellowship in emergency medicine, who were the people that you talked with? Who was it that sealed the deal that this was where you wanted to come for your, for your training? Well, at that time, uh, the, uh, there was uh, a couple of journals in emergency medicine that were well known and that I was reading. And Bruce Thompson, the residency director, had an article in every single journal. So every month, another article would come out from the Medical College of Wisconsin defining optimal care in emergency medicine. And I said to myself, you know, I don't know this Bruce Thompson guy, but I'll tell you what, if I was able to hang out with him for a little while, uh, for a year or two, I think I'd probably be well served. So uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin had a high profile. At that time, uh, Joe Darren, who was the chair of emergency medicine, and Bruce Thompson uh, were very academic, uh, uh, published a lot of papers, and caught my attention. In fact, you, you raised the, the point about Joe Darren. Joe Darren really was the, 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 the pioneer in emergency medicine here. And he also had a major commitment to research as well. Yeah. Were you, were you involved in his research activities uh, when, you, when you came to MCW? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> emergency care really started uh, with an Institute of Medicine report uh, titled Death and Disability in America. It was published in 1966 and identified a new public health problem, which was trauma traumatic injury and unnecessary deaths from traumatic injury due to uh, patients being transported to hospitals that did not have the capability to care for that significant problem. The IOM report had two recommendations. One was to establish trauma centers throughout the United States with the capability to care for this patient population. And the second was emergency medical services. Well, fast forward 10 years, and Congress allocated funding and an application to um, implement emergency medical services. Joe Darren was uh, uh, given the responsibility to establish the Department of Emergency Medicine here at the Medical College. And Joe Darren had phenomenal vision. So he applied for the funding, but he applied with a fundamental principle that you could not determine how well you were doing, identify areas of weakness, and improve care if you didn't measure it. And so Joe Darren incorporated uh, data acquisition in the Milwaukee County EMS system and data management to determine outcomes and to determine um, uh, quality of care from inception in 1976. This was his vision 
And incorporated into that was the need to do research, to, in, uh, to provide evidence that the care that you were providing patients was really optimal care and that you were getting the results that you wanted. That was Joe Darren's vision, and it continues today. Now, mm. his focus was also on heart attacks, on cardiac arrest then as well, if I remember correctly. And were you involved in the research activities with him uh, at that time? What, and did that help lead to your interest in cardiac arrest, or were there other things that, that prompted that interest? Really, what, <clears throat> what, uh, what prompted my interest to stay and, and my research career was the culture of excellence that Joe Darren uh, founded in this medical community for emergency care. So it really takes a village. So first he had one of the best EMS systems in the world that he created. But patients uh, have their problem in the community. They then go to one of 17 receiving hospitals and then have an outcome. Well, you need a collaboration with those receiving hospitals. Joe Darren established that collaboration from inception and there is an, has been an ongoing agreement that hospitals provide the outcome for these patients for continuous quality assurance purposes on an anonymous basis. And we have had that data since inception. Um, along with this came the Flight for Life program established by Joe Darren. The um, first, one of the first emergency medicine residencies established by Joe Darren, and of course the Department of Emergency Medicine and the Level 1 Trauma Center. Essentially everything that is emergency medicine in this community was founded by the vision of that individual and even today uh, is recognized as one of the best in the country. You were here <clears throat> at an exciting time when Dr. Darren was able to help get a lot of this off the ground and, and really be a pioneer. Has, how has the department grown uh, since Dr. Darren's uh, left and you know, um, Dr. Hargarten is now chairing it? Yeah. The department is still nationally recognized and how has that, how has that occurred? What have yeah. been some of the accomplishments that have helped right. uh, build the reputation of this department? Right. So Joe Darren is really my original hero, uh, along with Bruce Thompson. Um, Steve Hargarten has done a phenomenal job at increasing the sophistication and the um, uh, level of contribution of this wonderful collaborative uh, translational research community that we have uh, in Milwaukee County. Um, he has generated National Institutes of Health funding to make formal, very high quality research protocols possible uh, and um, to define new forms of care and optimal care uh, on an ongoing basis. What you've identified is something that's really unique and perhaps couldn't happen in many other communities where you get the collaboration. Uh, from the other hospitals, from the, uh, the, the county, from the EMS program. Um, was it Dr. Darren's personality and his, his collaboration that helped make this succeed? What, how did things happen? How did it succeed in Milwaukee where it may not have succeeded elsewhere? Yeah, I think um, it's multifactorial. So first of all, it was Joe Darren's vision. Uh, uh, second, um, it... Uh, it takes a village and the receiving hospitals uh, uh, and the community uh, decided to establish a, um, a council, an emergency medical services council that meets on a monthly basis. At the table are hospital administrators, department chairs of every emergency department, the EMS system and other major stakeholders. This group meets since 1976 on a monthly basis and addresses community problems, identifies uh, perhaps areas where improvement can occur, implements action plan throughout our community, and um, supports 
development of better ways to care for the people of Milwaukee, which has translated over the years to better cares, uh, better uh, approaches and care for patients, not only nationally, but internationally. Now, you know, we've talked about the collaborations that have existed within the community, but within the Medical College of Wisconsin and our partner hospitals, there have to be collaborations as well. Patients enter the emergency department, but then you need collaborators in other departments that are also going to be following up. Right. How, how has that developed? How have you been able to build those, those linkages uh, within the institution? Sure. So because there has been an emergency medicine residency, and those residents graduate, and then those residents go to emergency departments within our community, we have had colleagues that we have trained and have uh, uh, been trained to provide optimal care uh, throughout our community. We have capitalized on that and established the Milwaukee Emergency Medicine Research Consortium of uh, an individual at every receiving hospital who understands uh, what it takes to um, improve care and supports this process. And then through each individual protocol we will uh, sit down with, say, the Department of Cardiology uh, in this community or some other um, specialty for which we are um, studying, uh, uh, for a specialty for which we're studying, and meet with them, uh, get their collaboration, because there are people from their own hospital that are involved at the table. It has generated uh, an interest. Further, um, these individuals see improved care. And when they see that their participation and their collaboration results in higher survival rates, better uh, quality of life in those survivors, it generates more interest in continued collaboration. We have a phenomenal um, medical community uh, in Milwaukee and we're very, very privileged to have it. Now, when you started the emergency department was housed within Milwaukee County Medical Complex, yes. and then uh, a new facility was created. It was right next to the Level One Trauma Center that Children's Hospital of Wisconsin had, you know, and staffed by emergency medicine physicians from the medical college, and then eventually transferred to Freighter uh, when the uh, county uh, no longer supported a, a hospital. How did those transitions, uh, how do you, uh, when you look back on how things transitioned like that, how did things improve along the way? And, and how was the collaboration built with children's as well as with freighter? Right. right, so the, um, uh, the emergency medical services, uh, again, the emergency department, the residency program, the uh, you know, Milwaukee County EMS, the Flight for Life, <clears throat> the trauma center, were originated with the infrastructure that existed at the time. Then, through the years, uh, it was recognized that the Milwaukee County Emergency Department really wasn't a facility that was optimal. Uh, again, Joe Darren received the funding to develop and uh, create a new emergency department. Uh, Freighter Hospital was the obvious location to do that um, and produced a brilliant, uh, wonderful facility uh, for that. That has continued to grow and to be optimized throughout the years. Um, Children's Hospital came on board because uh, emergency care for children is just as important, if not more important, then for adults, they have special needs. Uh, as it's always said, children are not little adults. Um, and uh, children came, uh, uh, Children's Hospital came on board. We share, currently share um, all sorts of emergency care between the two departments. They are now located side by side, uh, uh, producing even further optimal care. So it's been a process of continuous growth and continuous progress. Now, you will probably be known best through the years for your work as a researcher in the field of cardiac arrest. What led to that, that interest? And, and when you look at your early years as a researcher, what were the projects you were involved in? And, and how did your career as a researcher evolve over the years? 
one of the things that attracted me to emergency medicine was that it was really a frontier. And I came on board right at the beginning of it, uh, an ability to become academically trained and board certified in this field. Honestly, at that time, the quality of care was varied. Uh, there were, for example, dermatologists who were working in the emergency department part-time. And I specifically remember an instance early on before I even started the residency where I was working in the emergency department and a dermatologist came up to me with a 12-lead electrocardiogram in their hand and said, Tom, can you interpret this EKG? Is this patient having a heart attack? Uh, because I have no idea what these squiggly lines mean. And I remember thinking, you know, if I spent my career in this field, I could probably improve the quality of care delivered. And particularly, I was interested in cardiac care, acute myocardial infarction, and then ultimately uh, also cardiac arrest. Uh, it is the number one killer in the United States, and emergency care of patients with cardiac arrest and with acute myocardial infarction define emergency care, which is time dependent. So the sooner that such patients are identified, the sooner the care is delivered, the better the survival and the better the outcome. It was a perfect emergency disease uh, to address for emergency medicine. And as you look at the early work that you did, what, what were some of the first things that you tried to tackle? Right. Some of the questions that you raised that you know, led you down the path of, as a researcher? I started uh, emergency medicine at a time when a tissue plasminogen activator or blood clot dissolving drugs were uh, immediately available for patients with heart attacks. At that time, the only way you could diagnose a heart attack was with an electrocardiogram. And that, though at that time, they were only available in emergency departments or doctor's offices. Um, that led to a significant delay. We did a study and showed that the time it took from arrival at the emergency department to recognition that somebody was having a heart attack and treatment was one and a half hours. And the reason for that is that many people have chest pain but are not having a heart attack. And so trying to determine which person of the many people who are having chest pain was actually the one that needed your immediate attention was a problem. At that time, I was working with a company called Marquette Electronics, which is now part of General Electric, uh, on development of uh, computerized interpretation of EKGs. We were working on the star, 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 acute MI, star, star, star algorithm. And in our discussions, I said, you know, if we could identify a patient in their home that was having an acute myocardial infarction, even before they arrived at the hospital, we could reduce this time. Uh, we could notify the cardiologist, the cardiologist could be waiting for this person at the door, and we could reduce the uh, door to balloon time or door to TPA time significantly. And in our, my collaboration with those individuals, uh, they developed the technology and we put the first three out of hospital 12 lead electrocardiograms out on the uh, paramedic rigs. Now, just as a point of collaboration, this first prototype device was a 30-pound steel suitcase that the EMS providers had to carry around in addition to all of their additional equipment. And Wauwatosa and West Dallas EMS raised their hands and said, we want to do this, Doc, because they saw the potential value to patients. Um, and they carried those 30-pound steel suitcases around for five years when we did the safety, the feasibility, and the efficacy studies and essentially found that through this approach, we could reduce the door to definitive treatment time to an average of 23 minutes. So you shaved off almost an hour. Well, over an hour. Over an hour. Yes. And that has now become the standard of care throughout uh, the world, frankly. 
So uh, it's now been software has been incorporated into defibrillators. There's no more 30 pound suitcase. Uh, and it is, if, for example, if you go to London and have chest pain, the ambulance is there. We'll get an out of hospital 12 lead electrocardiogram. And if you are having a heart attack, notify the hospital in London, um, uh, as well as almost every large uh, urban area in the world. That came out of the Milwaukee County EMS system because of Wauwatosa and West Dallas and the willingness of the EMS system and the hospitals to explore better ways to care for patients. That's terrific. Now, as, as you worked on the, uh, the, the 12 lead, what, what was then the next step that you looked at? What right. were the next things that you wanted to tackle? Uh, as you know, some, some patients with acute myocardial infarction have a cardiac arrest where the heart stops and CPR is required immediately. We became, uh, after we had established this as a standard of care and saw door to balloon times reduced uh, to 20 minutes and the survival rates uh, being uh, uh, increasing to 98, 97 percent, which w was unheard of at that time. We felt that we needed to tackle the next problem, which were the about 15 percent of individuals who actually had a cardiac arrest and um, whose outcome was poor. Um, there is a huge difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. A heart attack is when a blood clot stops blood supply to a portion of the heart. Although the patient is in distress, they are alert and oriented. And the goal there is to identify it rapidly, open up the artery in the cath lab, and to restore blood flow. Cardiac arrest, on the other hand, is where the heart suddenly stops beating. The patient instantly collapse, collapses, and uh, intervention has to occur immediately if there's any hope for survival. A uh, heart attack survival is about 97%. Um, cardiac arrest survival averages about 7%. So we started focusing on cardiac arrest. Our first uh, approach was public access defibrillation. So if a shock can be delivered to a patient in cardiac arrest within the first three minutes, there is a 75% chance that the patient will not only survive, but survive normally. At that time, uh, no one could provide a shock to a patient uh, except a certified emergency medical technician. So we did the first studies um, nationally. We participated in the public access defibrillation trial in which we uh, had locations throughout Milwaukee that either provided CPR and 911 or CPR 911 and application of an automated external defibrillator by a trained lay person without a duty to respond and found that it doubled survival, normal survival rate with neurologically intact survival How did survival you get rate. people to become trained? Did you put out a public call? Um, well, we identified locations that were interested in participating in the study mm -hmm. and we trained everyone in CPR. Okay. Uh, and then those locations that had AEDs, we trained them also in the application of the AED. At that time, it was unknown whether um, uh, an, uh, a lay person would actually respond, whether they would apply an AED correctly, whether they could deliver the shock in a timely way, and whether all of that would result in better outcome. Now, wasn't there any trepidation on the part of the, 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 the lay people involved that Am I qualified to do this? Do I know what I'm doing? Am yeah. I, yeah. Well, we trained, we trained them well okay. uh, through the American Heart Association training program. And um, uh, sure, uh, there is trepidation, but um, these individuals were interested in making a contribution and in helping others. And uh, as the end result was that it was phenomenally successful, and the results of that study have formed our national health care policy since. So today we have AEDs on airplanes, in airports, and in public locations throughout our communities, and they save thousands of lives every year. Fascinating. 
what was next? You know, um, you know, again, you know, you, you've, you've addressed so many different uh, components or aspects of cardiac arrest. What, what were some of the next things that you looked at then? So I became very interested in blood flow during CPR. Standard CPR only provides about 15% of normal blood flow, as if your heart was beating. So it is a very inefficient process. So I became interested in the physiology of blood flow during CPR. And there are two theories. One is that when you push down on the chest, the heart is compressed and therefore blood flows. The second and probably functional uh, theory is what's called the thoracic pump mechanism. So that it isn't a compression of the heart at all, that it, when you push down on the chest, the thoracic pressure is higher relative to the rest of the body. And because of one-way valves in the heart, blood flows forward. That, in fact, is a very efficient forward process. The inefficiency comes in the return of blood on the upstroke of CPR. Uh, the return of blood is due to a small negative pressure in the chest, and that suction pulls blood back up to the chest. I was collaborating with a colleague who um, wanted to test his biomedical device called the impedance threshold device, which was a simple device placed on the airway that caused greater suction on the upstroke of CPR, and therefore pulled more blood back up to the chest and therefore more blood on the downstroke. It coincidentally reduced intracranial pressure so that it nearly normalized blood flow to the brain. And this physiologic mechanism was very attractive to me because um, survival is not the end point for cardiac arrest. It's survival with good neurological outcome. And here was a new mechanism by which we could almost normalized blood flow, but especially normalized blood flow to the brain. Now, you mentioned the physiology of the heart. MCW has had an excellent reputation for the work that um, our faculty researchers have done in fields like physiology, anesthesiology, cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, right. neurology. How have the research projects and the, the people with an interest in heart disease and the, the physiology of the heart located in other departments been beneficial to the work that you've been doing? Right. So it, uh, it provided the foundation upon which we could then advance this next step. So uh, I don't know how to say it any more succinctly, but they provided the groundwork upon which we could then take the next step. Now, you've mentioned the American Heart Association as well. How did you become involved with the American Heart Association, and how have they been an influence on the work that you've done over the years? Right. Well, the American Heart Association, it's been a privilege for me to volunteer for the American Heart Association for the past uh, 30 years. I've been involved with the development of the CPR guidelines, and was asked really because of my research in cardiac arrest to uh, be on these committees that uh, would review the literature, determine optimal practice, and write uh, these guidelines. Uh, by studying improved blood flow uh, with these devices, uh, we made some other very important discoveries. Uh, one was that hyperventilation during cardiac arrest um, is profoundly detrimental and perhaps uh, even potentially fatal. Um, and that wasn't an intrinsically obvious thing. So if an individual had cardiac arrest and has not taken a breath, for example, for say 10 minutes, it seems intrinsic that you would catch them up and hyperventilate. Well, again, coming back to this thoracic pump mechanism, uh, increased pressure in the chest by hyperventilating causes high pressure that reduces the venous blood return to the chest and turns out to um, be detrimental to blood flow during CPR. And so uh, what we've learned is that we need to gradually increase and to not hyperventilate. 
So that was uh, widely accepted uh, for, by the American Heart. Those were incorporated into the American Heart uh, guidelines. We also identified leaning on the chest for the same reason. Causes high pressure in the chest, decreased blood flow, especially to the brain, and that that should be avoided. And as uh, also, we recognized in general that the quality of CPR provided really makes a huge difference in terms of survival and outcome, uh, which has led to electronic monitoring of CPR feedback in terms of the uh, rescuers to provide the optimal quality to avoid hyperventilation and incomplete chest recoil. And uh, through my collaboration with the American Heart Association, I was able to um, educate uh, the, uh, my colleagues and um, have those important aspects of care incorporated into the national and international CPR guidelines. Now, You've also been very, very involved with the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and they've been very supportive of your research over the years as well. Yeah. How did that? How did that develop? And, and what kind of uh, changes, perhaps, in the work that you've done have influenced the work that the uh, you know National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute does in terms of the projects they support? Well, NHLBI was uh, very. Um, kind in asking me initially to serve on the National Heart Attack Alert Program. Because of my work with pre-hospital 12 lead ECGs, identif identifying this major public health problem, which was a one and a half hour delay to treatment of patients with heart attacks, and uh, to promulgate more rapid identification and treatment. Uh, so I participated in that uh, national uh, effort for about 10 years um, to get hospitals, cardiology departments, EMS systems, emergency departments to collaborate together to make this sequence of events that had to occur from the house to the EMS to the emergency department to the cath lab um, synchronous uh, throughout the country. So that's really what started my collaboration with uh, NHLBI. And then subsequently with our ideas and our discoveries, we uh, wrote um, grants to provide us the opportunity to further study uh, our discoveries and demonstrate uh, efficacy of these different approaches. If Joe Darren were alive today and looked and saw how you've taken some of the initial things that he had been involved in and where you've taken them now, what do you think would be the thing that he would be most pleased to see? What, 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 what would have uh, been the thing that he would have taken pride in knowing that he helped be one of the, uh, part of the infrastructure? Well, I think Joe would take immense pride in knowing that the phenomenal collaborative infrastructure and vision that he established has resulted in so much care, uh, improved care, improved survival, and improved quality of life uh, for the citizens of Milwaukee. Now, emergency medicine is unlike many other departments in that um, as you are working on clinical studies, you're dealing with the patient population that isn't always available, isn't able to give consent. Mm -hmm. And so you've had to deal with issues of exception from informed consent. You've been very successful in working on studies where you've been able to engage the public at least up front so that they're, they're aware of these studies. How, how has that gone about and how have you been involved in some of the, uh, the policy making that has gone on in terms of how do we make sure that we have an informed public? So um, many of these, not all, but many of these uh, emergency care clinical trials um, occur in individuals who are not capable of providing informed consent. The Food and Drug Administration of the United States uh, established in 1995 a process called exception from informed consent under emergency circumstances. Uh, after a two-year process whereby they got input from 
uh, survivors, from, no, from non-survivor families, from stakeholder organizations, and so forth, and recognized that, in or, that our current care is unsatisfactory. And for cardiac arrest, I would say that a 7% survival rate with, frankly, about half of those individuals having neurologic damage that do survive is, by anybody's standard, unsatisfactory. Um, that our treatments are unsatisfactory and that there are new treatments which hold prospect of direct benefit and improved outcome compared to our current treatments. So the exception from informed consent criteria are very strict, but they in, uh, mandate that the science, as, as viewed by the Food and Drug Administration, holds significant prospect for a better outcome than our current standard. So that everyone receives either the current standard or an intervention felt to be possibly better and provide direct benefit to the participant. Now, uh, that's the criteria to be able to do it, but uh, in addition, the Food and Drug Administration requires an outreach to the community. Uh, that initial process is called community consultation. So we consult with the community through a variety of ways. We do random digit dialing surveys. We meet with, uh, we do town hall meetings. We do small group meetings and derive feedback from the community to determine whether there is a sense from the community that uh, they wish to have this study performed. If that feedback is positive, as viewed by, not by me, but by the Institutional Research Board at the Medical College and the other IRBs in town, and they find that the feedback from the community is positive and that the community thinks that it should be done. We then go to a second process called public notification. So we go on the television, the radio, uh, newspapers, uh, newsletters, and a variety of other uh, <coughs> mechanisms to um, notify the community. And we get feedback from people who read uh, or hear, hear about it. And we take that feedback back to the uh, institution's research board. If the institution's research board feels that there has been adequate coverage of the uh, Milwaukee County area, that the f continued feedback that we've received is a positive, then and only then do we get approval to uh, implement the clinical trial. That's not the end of the story because all that does is allow us to implement the study every single individual who is entered. Uh, we have an obligation to notify, so we notify either the individual or the individual's family that their loved one was entered in the trial. We let them know why. Uh, we uh, remind them of the public uh, community consultation and public notification process. Uh, and then if the family is willing, they uh, provide us with informed consent for continued participation in the trial. It is a very rigorous process. It is tightly and strictly regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, all these studies are uh, monitored by the FDA <coughs> and all of these uh, trials require an da independent data safety monitoring board that monitors the safety of all subjects. But it's so important because again you need the data. You need the information to find out whether what you're doing is right, has any merit. You, you just completed a recent study that looked at some medications that had been used, but there had been no previous work done to ever identify whether there was value in right. using those. What, what came in that? What were the outcomes of that study? Well, I, I would use our discovery of hyperventilation as an obvious case where um, common sense would indicate if somebody hasn't taken a breath for 10 minutes that you should catch them up and hyperventilate. Uh, get rid of the uh, carbon dioxide and the acid in the bloodstream, get the acid-base status of that individual back to normal as quickly as possible. And it turns out that that's actually fatal. Um, where a process that common sense would say you should do this 
and you actually find out that it is the worst thing that you can possibly do. So evidence is what is required in order to demonstrate efficacy and safety and improved care. So without the ability to do this kind of work, progress and improved survival and improved uh, outcome would be impossible. Now, you've been the recipient of one of the major honors that a physician could receive. You've been elected to the Institute of Medicine. What does it mean to you to be a member of the Institute of Medicine? And what has that membership enabled you to do as you've, as you've advanced your, your studies? Well, the, uh, it has been a great honor uh, to have been inducted into the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. They just changed their name. They are now called the National Academy of Medicine. So it is the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, <clears throat> this is a uh, institute that um, uh, selects individuals who have made significant contributions in their field. And to be selected as an individual uh, to uh, be a member of that organization is a tremendous honor and a tremendous privilege. It also has provided an opportunity uh, to advance uh, emergency cardiac care in this country. The Institute of Medicine is unique in that it has uh, some of the world's leading scientists, but it also is directly connected with Congress, with the government, uh, and with large uh, institutions with potential funding. And so at the table are governmental agencies, uh, large funding organizations, as well as the world's leading scientists. So it provides the opportunity for public health, for example, a new public health problem, to get all of the uh, interested stakeholders in the country to address that problem and to determine how best to improve outcome throughout the United States for uh, that particular public health issue. So um, I had the uh, privilege of um, proposing to the Institute of Medicine that we really needed a IOM report on cardiac arrest. The cardiac arrest is the third leading cause of death in the United States that our treatments are unsatisfactory and the outcomes at an average of 7% are unsatisfactory, and that we have demonstrated treatments that work. The problem is that our communities don't implement those treatments. So let me explain that a little. There is a standard chain of survival. Early 911, early CPR, early defibrillation, high quality resuscitation practice by emergency medical services, and optimized post-arrest care in hospital. And those have been proven, they work, but they are not systemically consistently implemented in our community. And each one of those steps has to occur rapidly and has to occur in sequence and needs to be strong. And those links are not strong in our communities, and they are not consistently provided in our communities, and the dismal survival rate from cardiac arrest reflects that. So the Institute of Medicine uh, uh, put together a um, IOM report committee on cardiac arrest, and we published that report uh, about a year ago, uh, June of 2015. I was fortunate enough to be able to uh, be an author of that uh, report and to also have a follow-up workshop uh, last week, as a matter of fact, um, to get consensus to develop a national cardiac arrest collaborative in this country, to have a unified public voice, uh, to message in a unified way the public, the need to learn CPR, uh, et cetera, and to implement the IOM recommendations nationally. Those recommendations in, uh, include establishing a national cardiac arrest registry so that we can measure 
our outcomes reliably, to train uh, every uh, middle and high school student in CPR as a requirement for graduation, to uh, improve uh, funding for uh, cardiac arrest research, to uh, have uh, programs to make EMS resuscitation practice consistently better, as well as to provide benchmarking for hospitals in terms of optimized hospital care throughout this country, addressing cardiac arrest as a major public health issue uh, to implement what we know works consistently in all of our communities. Now, through your work, Milwaukee has been engaged in one of the locations in North America that has participated in several of these different uh, cardiac arrest uh, research studies. How has Milwaukee benefited by being a center, a, a community that is engaged in these studies? What is the benefit it brings to the community compared to those communities that were not involved in the study? A, s a very short answer is that survival rate from cardiac arrest is approaching 14% in our community and averages seven throughout the country. So our outcomes in terms of survival rates as well as neurological outcome and quality of care are basically double the national standard and we are close to the, the highest, we are probably the second highest survival rate in the world. Wow. You've had the opportunity to work alongside other researchers throughout the world. Who have been some of the people that have been your colleagues? Who have you partnered with uh, and uh, have helped you as you've uh, pursued this, this uh, line of research? Um, the list is really long. <laughs> you know, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, it is, uh, frankly, uh, similar to my previous comments that it takes a village. So the individuals I would uh, identify uh, immediately would be uh, Dr. Joseph Ornato at uh, Richmond, um, uh, Dr. Mike Weisfeld uh, at Johns Hopkins, as well as a host of other uh, individuals and colleagues uh, that um, have collaborated and supported me uh, throughout my career. What's next? as you look at the line of study and the, what we have learned, every, everything that we've learned in cardiac arrest builds on the information we've known before. It's, it's sort of like pieces of a puzzle. What's the next piece of the puzzle that you want to, you want to tackle? So the future of cardiac arrest is very, very bright. So now we have, uh, Biomedic, simple biomedical devices that nearly normalize blood flow during CPR. That provides us with the opportunity to provide treatments for patients that we felt previously were not even treatable. So um, we are taking patients who have uh, not responded to standard care doing CPR with normal blood, almost normal blood flow with this process to the cath lab, looking at their arteries, almost all of them from ventricular fibrillation cardiac arrest are having a heart attack, open up the arteries uh, with CPR in progress, and then are able to restart the heart and uh, in our very small preliminary uh, clinical trial have resulted in a 53% survival rate with good neurologic outcome. And that is opposed to a 0% survival rate uh, otherwise. So that new technology has allowed us the opportunity to provide new treatments. Um, we have also um, uh, identified uh, areas that are tremendously promising called ischemia reperfusion injury when there is no blood flow for a particular period of time and then blood flow is just instantly started up again, that re sudden reperfusion causes cell death. And what we have discovered is that most of the cell death actually occurs by suddenly reperfusing rather than the lack of blood flow initially. 
Uh, so within 10 or 15 minutes, the real cell death occurs when you reperfuse. We have identified several very easy to implement um, interventions. Well, one is called stutter CPR. So rather than instantly reperfusing, we do CPR for 20 seconds, then stop for 20 seconds. On for 20 seconds, off for 20 seconds. Now it isn't intrinsically obvious that that would be a good thing, but it gradually improve, uh, increases blood flow and we do that for three minutes and then continue the CPR. Um, and in our animal model, uh, there's 80% survival uh, of these animals that are normal neurologic function versus 0% otherwise. So um, we are investigating a variety of other interventions that are very simple, uh, some drugs, some um, uh, gases, that produce similar outcomes and we are close to uh, getting the opportunity to, to do the first in man clinical trials. So the future looks very, very bright. You've spent your career at the Medical College of Wisconsin. What has it meant to you to be at MCW? Why have you stayed? You've had opportunities to go elsewhere. Sure. What is it about MCW and our partner hospitals that has kept you here? It is, well, first of all, it is the support that I receive from the Medical College of Wisconsin, which I greatly appreciate. But it's really the collaborative medical community that exists at this uh, location, F founded again by Joe Darren, okay, 30 years ago, that has led to a collaborative culture of, that is focused on and genuine interest in improved care for the people of this city. And that's what's kept me here. Another area that looks tremendously promising is the area of vasodilation during CPR versus vasoconstriction. So with these new bio devices that are now approved by FDA for general use in the United States, and there are 60 EMS systems that are now implementing this approach, um, we have found that we can actually uh, dilate blood vessels rather than constrict them. Epinephrine constricts blood vessels and it has been the fundamental uh, drug used for cardiac arrest for the past 50 years. It produces a blood pressure but has a horrible consequence and it constricts blood vessels so tightly that the blood flow to the end organ, like the brain and the heart, is compromised. With the new biomedical devices, we can actually give a drug called sodium nitroprusside, which is the opposite of epinephrine, which massively dilates all blood vessels in the body. And with these devices, we can maintain a, blood, a very good blood pressure and then get superb blood flow to both the heart and the brain. And that holds tremendous promise. Uh, so we, again, we are getting close to the first in man clinical trials for that also. Terrific. Yeah. But it has been um, an honor and a privilege to uh, work at this institution, uh, to work with uh, the medical community here in Milwaukee, and to feel that we have in some ways uh, made, the, uh, made the world a little better place uh, through collaboration and through this tremendous uh, network, a uh, collaborative network that exists in our community. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.